welcome to Freeform Conversations with Michal, where we discuss the polar method and other approaches to wellness. If you know in your heart that self-healing is possible and you wish to explore new ways to get in touch with your body and assist it in doing its amazing work, join us. I think you'll enjoy these conversations. Hi everyone, welcome to the first episode of Freeform Conversations with Michal. I'm Michal and each week I'm going to have a different guest uh, and we're going to discuss self-healing, well-being and of course the polar method. But since most of my, my guests are going to be health practitioners, we'll discuss other approaches to wellness and self-healing. Today, for the very first episode, I invited a good friend of mine, who's also a health practitioner. Her name is Kristen Myers. Kristen is the co-founder, together with her husband, of the Myers Institute. Um, they developed a method that is called FMCM, which stands for Facial Metrics um, Connection Method. And they address life stress and trauma in infants, children, and adults. Kristen is also a very talented artist, and she has a, a second business in which she shares her art with people. Her second business is called Animals and Spirit. Kristen created a painting of a peony for me, and she took time lapse of that um, creation process. And I used those uh, time lapses as the opening video for my uh, YouTube um, um, videos of the podcast. So if you happen to watch us on, on YouTube, the time lapse that you see was created by Kristen. So hi, Kristen, and thank you so much for being my first guest on the podcast. I figured the co-creation here was going to be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I am a licensed massage therapist. However, if you came to me for a massage, you would be greatly disappointed. I've never really done massage in my, in my career, which has been about, well, it's been over 20 years. Um, I very quickly got into the realm of fascia. It was very fascinating to me and um, studied MFR and different methodologies. Um, and they were amazing. Um, and then I went into my own um, healing, you know, I needed some healing for myself after my daughter was born. Um, and my husband and I, who my husband is also um, the co-founder of Myers Institute and FMCM, we began to work with my body very intuitively in the fascial system. And that's when the big healing came and we were, knew we were onto something. Um, so our work evolved very quickly after that, um, and that is how it became FMCM. Um, so our, our work has devoted to helping people um, step out of limitations that have occurred from life stresses and traumas and those that have started from conception on. So we work with newborns and children and adults, um, and very specifically with the fascial system. And we call it the matrix because it is not only just the connective tissue and the physical aspect, but it's, it's the consciousness and it's the emotions and it's all those things that have accumulated and made us who we are. Um, so that is kind of like the, the basis of, of our work. Um, and our work is, is a combination of movement therapy uh, where you are very active in, in your healing and we assist you by recognizing these restrictions that are in the body and help you identify them because most people walk around life um, not really in their bodies. They're kind of like protecting and armoring and compensating. Um, and so our job is to help you see that and then inhabit yourself again, safely, gently, 
and move into those areas of restrictions and release them and just release them. And so something that could be just a tight neck or tight hips can impact your health in so many ways, emotionally and physically. And when we can unravel them, unravel the fascia, then this massive healing can occur. Um, so we do that with all ages, basically. And that, that's been our work. It's amazing. And <laughs> several things came up to me while you were talking and describing your work. First of all, shame. <laughs> the shame is something that goes hand in hand, I think, with expressing our emotions in our body and the natural movement that our body is interested in doing, whether it is facial expressions, sounds, movements that are either not acceptable or not considered or impolite in our uh, society, and also complaining or expressing pain that is related to the body or injuries, it is kind of like unacceptable. Yeah. And very specific things that our society accepts and most others are not acceptable. So people feel shame about even feeling that or wanting to express that while the expression itself is already a form of healing. And we tend to hold it back on ourselves. And that's also how we, we raise our children to learn to behave as adults. So as you were talking and I was hearing about all the aspects of your work and I, I thought for myself, yes, and that also people are not allowed to do all of that. And in your work, they're invited to express everything that is related to their physical state. And that is of course their entire existence. Um, and yeah. I also know one of the first conversations we had when we first met uh, about two years ago, yeah, I think the first time we met, we took a walk on the beach and we talked about, we were with a group of people and the two of us started talking about the effect that parents have on their children's emotional uh, understanding of life and how they express or do not express these stresses in their physical being. Remember yes. that? Remember that? I, do, I, do. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I found a twin soul <laughs> in this world. Like you totally got it. <laughs> I mean, it's not only that you got it, you had a lot to add to that. And I was yeah. like, oh wow, you're doing yeah. something very, very interesting. And uh, I, that's where my, my interest in your work started. Well, and I have to add that I am also a student of Paula method. Now, after our relationship started, I was so fascinated with your work and knowing that there was a, there was definitely some pa massive parallels there. Um, and, okay. the, and they are, they are completely are. Absolutely. You were the first one to, to mention that, which was, which was only when I saw you working that I understood how deep those parallel lines are. Like, this is absolutely right. Um, I'll, just for the listeners, I'll, I'll explain what it is that I'm talking about, okay? Um, so when I teach uh, Pola, not only me, any teacher of the Pola method, I can start with exercises and see how the client or the student um, relates to that or um, um, responses to the work or responding to the work or I can just kind of start with, let's say, hands over eyes and allow the body to show us what's, what it wants. So with some people, with hands over eyes, there's some spontaneous movement that begins and then the work kind of initiates itself. And I try as a teacher not to, um, not to distract that natural flow. So with you, Kristen, it started right away. I don't even know if we even got into hands over eyes, but just as you lie down on the mattress, you started working immediately, spontaneously in a very deep way. And I was fascinated by that work. And I found myself the entire session kind of debating 
whether to say something because honestly, I haven't said a word yet. <laughs> it started working or to keep shutting my mouth and not interrupt what you were doing. And I ended up kind of like apologizing for not saying anything. <laughs> Yeah, I remember <laughs> not wanting to disturb, you know, to disturb this amazing flow, which was very deep. And if I'm right, I may not remember correctly, and you can correct me, was also had big effects on you right after that session. So on the one hand, I, I felt like I was not contributing much to the session. You just, you know, all I gave you was kind of like, I gave you the stage to do your own work. Uh, but on the other hand, you felt like you were um, allowed to explore and do things in a different way, or I don't know. Can you can you tell me a little bit about your side of that? Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> the first lesson was so fascinating um, because, like, I'm I'm used to to doing the spontaneous movements and, and our, our methodology is called unwinding, which by the way, I, I don't like that term. It doesn't, it's never resonated with me. Um, so when you called it free form, I was not only that, it's not only un unwinding, right? Yeah, it's not, it's, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't capture the essence of it at all. Um, but I remember thinking I probably shouldn't move because this isn't right in the Paula method. Cause I, I made a judgment on it. Yeah. And then, you didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. And I thought I'm going to scare most her. people's judgment. So don't, don't feel bad about it. <laughs> I said, I'm going to scare her by all this crazy movement. So, so I held it in and, um, and you're incredibly intuitive and, you know, in your expertise, you saw that I needed to move and you encouraged me. And so that's what I was like, okay, I can do this here. Um, so I, I let it go. And I think what's so important when somebody is doing this type of work is, um, is the allowance and the safety of the space and the person holding the space. And that is what you did for me. You held the space for me to feel comfortable to um, explore areas of my body that were tight and, and go into those spaces and then encourage me or, or help me find a, a different way of doing it. Maybe that was more effective. Um, so I can easily lay down on my floor and, and do my work myself, but to have the work that you do there in that space with me um, enhanced it so greatly and made it such a fabulous experience. Um, and, it, and it helped that we were on the beach as well. So. I was actually referring to the first time that we met. It was actually in, in a space. It was yes. at my space. It wasn't at the beach yet. It that, wasn't, no. The very first no. one. Um, but I really connect to what you're saying. I know that for many people, but including myself, doing the work while somebody else witnesses it and holds the space for that, meaning that everything is allowed and everything is it's, it's beyond that. It's not, that, it's not only that everything is acceptable in a polar method, in a polar, polar session. It is also that we value everything that happens and we know that this is the spontaneous expression of the body while doing its own healing work. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate and respect everything that's happening. Yeah. Uh, so I think that this feeling of oh my god I'm now witnessing for instance during that first session when I didn't say a word for the entire time I was only witnessing something which I knew was extremely deep and meaningful and serious and helpful <laughs> yeah. like that was the real work and even though I didn't say anything you felt that you were held and respected deeply for whatever you were doing and that is something that is just in the energy, with the energy in the room, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's like you said a little while ago, and we as a society, we tend to label like trauma with the big T and the little T, you know, so if we didn't fight in a war or have this horrific accident, then we, we don't deserve to feel this stuff that's in us. Like, I don't have a right. I should just, just get on with your life. And and go about your day. And, you know, it wasn't that bad, was it? Was it really that bad? 
And, and it was so that. many other people have been through that. How come that you take it so seriously? <laughs> Are you overly sensitive? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right. Well, clearly, um, you know, it does matter because it all, it all absorbs into our body and becomes a way of being, which is not functional. It's not, it's, it's, it can be dysfunctional. Um, and it's not a full expression of who we really are. Absolutely. I want to add something to this. When you uh, spoke about, you know, is it a um, capital T or big T trauma? And I, Something that I've noticed uh, in the past few years is that surgeries are not considered trauma with a big T. I kind of like see this more and more recently, the more I kind of like am aware of, you know, during lessons when t- people talk to me or they talk to their body and they express it, express it you know, um, in my presence, the body or people's bodies often say how difficult surgeries are on them and how the trauma lingers for a really long while in the body. And I even think it lingers there forever unless we open up to healing it, healing that trauma. And again and again, I hear from people who do open up this communication with their body, that the body was really scared. You know, for most surgeries, people get anesthesia. And so it is as if they're not there, but the body is always there, even if we are asleep. And the body has its own, I don't know, it's, it's its own entity. And this entity is there scared like a little kid, you know, with- And, and the owner of this yeah. thing is asleep. So there is such um, conflict there, you know, or I don't know, it's problematic. Yeah. It is very, yeah, because all the anesthesia does is erase the mem, like the memory, the, the, the brain memory, but the body memory is always there. Always. Always, yeah. And then once we're up and continue with our lives after the surgery, people will say, oh, come on everybody's going like uh, people do such surgeries let's say c-sections right all the time this is a major (laughs) surgery but women so many women go through this surgery and they're told like uh, you know everybody's doing it it's like just get over it come on and and the truth is that it is not that easy and women no. in a way and, and people in general right like people do cataract surgeries uh knee replacements all kinds of things that are so plastic surgeries all kinds of things that are so common in our society nowadays and people just i, I i'm always amazed at people like coming to work two days after a cataract surgery or sometimes the day after and i'm like really you're already at work And they're like, yeah, it's just a cataract surgery. I'm like, oh. Yeah, yeah. But that's, yeah. The, that's the convention. Mm. For sure. It's a programming and, and um, you know, oh, you'll be fine. You know, you can go back to work or, and, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's like the standard of the, the model. But what about, you know, what about the spirit and the, and the body needing that extra time to process what just happened and um, yeah. And where is the help? Right. Who does this work? Who helps people go over, you know, the whole, really the entire, like the complete uh, experience of what they, they've been through. Yeah. I think very few people do this work nowadays. And yeah. um, and you My- do it. You do my, it and I do it. Uh, I do. I'm very my my passion and a lot of and my specialty is is with women who have had um surgeries and trauma related to to birth, birthing. Um and I also work with with babies who have spent time in the NICU, which is a huge trauma for, for the entire family unit. Um and I could agree more. Yeah, my clinical research has shown that 
while these medical procedures are life-saving and absolutely necessary, they imprint on the child's body and can have lifelong effects. Um, yeah, and those, you know, those are just, you know, it's like they're, you know, the, the tubes, the tubes are out, the NG tubes are out, the ventilator's off, your baby's good to go, go home. But that's not where the trauma ends. It's like, it's there, it's in the body. The body remembers everything body remembers everything that's so yeah true. yeah I wanted to kind of like uh, <laughs> use an opportunity uh to ask you something um you know when I studied massage <laughs> also many years ago not 20 but <laughs> many years ago over I don't know 13 years ago maybe um one of the things that we were taught about fascia is, and I, that's like one thing that really, I remember myself going home, kind of driving back home and thinking, oh, what the, the teacher said was, once there is a cut in the fascia and there is a scar tissue, that will affect the body forever. And it can be a minor cut in the, I don't know, finger or, you know, so, and I, I was like, that's so interesting. In a way, I kind of knew it in my body, but nobody ever told me that. So again, like many other things in life, I kind of brushed it off and I said, oh, it was a minor cut. But I always felt like all these little injuries, they have a deep meaning for my physical existence. And I remember driving back home and kind of counting. So how many times did I cut my finger? How many times did I cut my knee, you know, as, as a kid and also as an adult and all of that. And I was like, wow, this is so much trauma for my body. And then I said, but these are minor injuries. Then one day I had a, um, like a trial session with somebody. I can't even remember what her modality was. Something, I can't remember. But she said, there's something in the back of your hand. like the, the. And I was like, yes, there is. She couldn't see it. And I don't think anyone can see it anymore. Uh, unless, oh, it's in this hand. I don't know if anyone can see it anymore. But I got this tiny injury at the back of my hand. And I had a scar that is shaped like a, like a thin moon. And that was like my scar, my entire childhood. And at the age, like my late forties, she still felt it. And I was like, wow, anyone would tell you this is a minor injury, right? But I had that scar and it was my scar, my entire childhood. And she thought it was a serious thing. So if you can please elaborate more about fascia and scars and all of that, because that is- I your... love to. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so fascia is um, very interesting in that, um, you know, it's a dimension of internal wholeness. It's everywhere in your body. So it's, it's down to the cellular level. It wraps through every body system, you know, superficial all the way into the deepest parts of our body. Um, and so when one area tightens, it sends a ripple effect through that body system. So if you could imagine, it's almost like a sweater, like a body sweater. And say you get a cut in your hand, imagine that as being like the fiber of the sweater, like the, the thread, and you pull on it. You get that ripple of the weave of it starting to derange. Um, and that can go from a simple, small cut. It can be an injection, you know, just as simple as really? an, an injection point, a blood draw point, a, any needle. And so what the needle goes in, it twists um, and it'll send this ripple effect into the, the web of the fascia. The fascia is, um, it's, it's filled with so much, there's so many pieces of it that's just unexplainable yet. People are studying it like on very deep levels and it sends information. It's an information, it's like a, um, a fast highway of information and it's, it sends that through the system. So depending on the level of 
pain or emotional confusion that accompanies that injury is also how it's going to impact the body because the body is going to tighten with it. So one of the jobs of fascia is to protect. Um, It is kind of like our shock absorber of the body. So if you get a cut and you, and you brace your whole body down into that injury, your whole body is going to constrict into that little wound. And most of us are not told or trained. We don't know what we don't know to shake that off, you know, and discharge the body and stretch it and move it and open that contraction that happened from the fear or the surprise or whatever the emotion is. So it's a, it's a com- the fascia absorbs a combination of the physical trauma as well as the emotional. Um, so that's why some people can go through a significant trauma and seemingly come out fine. And other people can have the same trauma and it wreaks chaos in their body. I think back to like the C-section and, um, you know, there's some women who have a C-section and they have the physical scar and the restrictions that go with it. And then with other women, it's the same, but it's so much deeper and emotional and traumatic depending on how it happened. Like if it was a planned C-section versus an emergency, oh my gosh, we have to do this right now. Um, so it, there's a lot of variables that impact the fascia um, and it's, comp- it's pretty complex, but yes, it, it can, the fascia absorbs any, any, any physical impact will create this ripple effect into the tissue. Right. First of all, I didn't know that it can go into like this tiniest detail, like, you know, a penetration of a needle just to draw mm-hmm. blood or I don't know, an injection. That's fascinating yeah. to hear so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I, when I uh, work on a body, you know, if I, if I'm palpating through the arm um, and I come to a spot, like was, did you have a blood draw there? Oh yes. I used to donate blood all the time. Well, there's a massive restriction in that area that, oh, well, maybe that may be contributing to your chronic shoulder pain. It most likely is because it rippled up from the, from the, you know, the IV or the draw site, and then it ripples into the rest of the body. Oh my God. I guess so now I have like more personal questions for you. I'll ask you another time. <laughs> Speaking of injections. Bring them, bring them on. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you from the healing side of it, how much can we heal the fascia from your experience? Yeah. So every little thing can affect the fascia. But then when we want to heal the body, how much of it can we? I don't know, um, rehabilitate. I don't know if you can use rehabilitation for fascia. Just tell me about the healing of the fascia, whatever you can, because I'm really curious about sure. that. Um, I've seen some pretty, what people say would be impossible healings and very miraculous um, brain surgery scars break down and completely open and change. You know, is that is that permanent? Probably we'll always have to, to work around scar tissue, you know, the body's going to want to always, you know, keep that space protected, but the fascia has the ability to, to break apart. So fascia is very fluid. It should, at a healthy state should be very fluid. It should, it should glide. Um, and there's a lot, it's filled with fluid. It's like, I think it's like 70, 80% fluid, but when there's trauma or stress, it becomes crystallized and hardens um, and, and toxins fill that space. So it goes from a fluid state to, it can go to as hard as bone. Um, really? Yes. It can, go, oh it can get, it, it feels, it can feel like bone. Wow. Um, and so then of course, then we lose function, complete function. We oh, lose um, whatever body system can be entrapped in, in, in that will also be impaired. Um, when we, break that tissue apart, you know, and, and break it apart. It's not like it snaps, like a piece of spaghetti where, you you know, it just like a rubber band, it doesn't just break it, it elongates and goes through its molecular changes 
to come back into that fluid state. When it does that, the body will detox because we store stress hormones in there and whatever things that are in going through the body. If there's medications, say it's a surgery, there's medications, um, you know, the environment, whatever, those will also get trapped in that crystallization. So when we can open and break that apart, the body will get rid of that. Um, and that, that creates some of the strong responses that you, that I've dealt with. Um, and we have to, you know, support the body to eliminate that. Once they go, that fascial tissue goes back to its fluid state and function and, and um, performance can return. So it depends, you know, there's a lot of variables, how much trauma is in the body, how much scar tissue, how much the person believes they can heal their emotional state. They, you know, can I, how, how far can I go? Can I heal this? You know, if someone doesn't believe they can heal it, then it's going to be harder. Yeah. Um, so I, I've seen a lot of, um, I've worked with children who were, this one child was missing um, a corpus callosum in her brain. And um, through the work, connections were made and she started making attempts to walk for the first time and sitting up on her own, holding her own bottle, things that she wasn't doing. And her parents believed fully that, that she could heal. And she did, and she's healing. So it's yeah, miraculous, really, it really is. There's a whole world of healing that is out there that you and I are <laughs> trying to share here, <laughs> really. And, and I so love listening to those stories that oh, also oh, yeah. hear, um, about your work because really these, it sounds like miracles, but then for you, it seems normal because you, you understand how the body works and how the body, one thing that I think many people are not aware of is that the body is interested in healing and the body will always help us the body is trying to do the healing on its own. Sometimes yeah. there are different things that kind of um, restrict or uh, make the work of the body harder on it. But when people like you and I and other healers um, come and try to help, the body most usually will collaborate so willingly. Um, and therefore, we know that these things are possible. And, yeah, uh, it's. It, I think that is what I love most about my work. I guess this is probably true for you as well. Yeah, it's definitely, and it's a mindset too. I mean, we've been taught that things have to be hard. Like we have to put a lot of work into it, and it has to be hard. And if it's not, then it doesn't work. It's not. It's not possible, and that's not true. We we, we just <laughs> yeah, effective. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I love that you brought to the conversation the ease, the part of ease, right? Which is um, something that I love as well. So let's let's go deeper into that, or yeah, you yeah. Know, think and uh, talk about this a little about the ease of work and the fact that the work doesn't have to be difficult, hard, or even not necessarily painful, even if we're dealing with pain, depends. Sometimes it is painful, but um, okay. So just tell me whatever you like. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to put words into your mouth. <laughs> I, I have a great What did you mean when you said easy? Easy, yeah. So I had a, a story that popped in my head really quickly. It was interesting. Right. many years ago. It was actually um, my husband, Michael, was treating um, a gentleman and he was um, a big, a, a large man, worked very hard, like physically hard, was dealing with um, chronic headaches. And um, Michael did a session on him and his body. He didn't have any spontaneous movement. It, it, it looked like he laid on the table and did nothing for an hour. <laughs> and he was, the gentleman was kind of um, upset. He said, you know, that was it. That's, he did nothing on me. Um, 
And then the next day we got a call. He said, my entire body aches. And he's like, I felt like I, I was at the gym. And so, and so we supported it, you know, like these are the things you can do to support. This is healing. This is your body healing. And after his body went through all the stages of, of the healing process, the headaches went away and he felt completely different and his mind was blown, but he just couldn't understand like how you could put your hands on me and do what felt like nothing. Was it that easy that, that my headache is gone? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, this is where many times or often the belief system of that person will come into effect. Because if the person believes that, okay, this is impossible. It is impossible that I healed my vision. It is impossible that I healed my headaches. It is impossible that I healed, I don't know, some other kind of chronic pain or uh, movement restriction. The body will manifest it again, if that is what the person wants. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is where really the work can be that easy. The question is, are we going to support us as individuals, going to support the continuation of the healing, or are we going to get, you know, kind of like locked in a, I don't know, state of fear or disbelief? And we will manifest either that thing or something else that will bring us back to a place where we feel comfortable, where we're more restricted or with less ease in our lives, right? That's, those are great comments, such great comments, because that is part of the healing. You know, if, if we, we do the work and then afterwards go into a state of fear of how the body's responding, yeah, you, you get caught in a cycle. And, and then we are getting in our own way of, of the healing rather than supporting it and going with the ease, going into the ease of it. You know, we're, we're resisting and resisting and resisting. It's going to be harder. Absolutely. Yeah. I loved that you chose that story about the man because this is something that... First of all, I see that a lot in my work, but I also love to hear about this from other healers or other um, body practitioners or you know, health practitioners from other fields. Uh, I love to give the, um, um, the example of my aunt. So one of my aunts is a uh, physical therapist. In the area where she lives in Israel, she's well known. And I remember myself as a little girl going with her to her clinic or to the hospital. And she, she dealt with serious injuries and would go through the hospital and have all those soldiers, you know, hanging, like limbs hanging from all kinds of, uh, I don't know what they're called, straps uh, from the ceiling, you know, healing from all kinds of serious injuries. Yeah. And one of the things that I remember um, people love her. She's, she's a sweet woman, uh, my aunt. And um, I remember her clients joking with her and also telling me as a little girl that she tor tortures them, you know, like working really deep on the tissue and, and doing all kinds of exercises and movements with them. It's very profound. I also remember that at some point she also studied, um, and now she's into all of those more, you know, holistic uh, modalities. But back in the day, when all of this just started in Israel, she studied um, uh, reflexology and she tried it in all the family. And I loved her reflexology sessions, but I remember that they were very painful. And later on, going to other reflexologists because I fell in love with this um, modality, it wasn't as painful. And many, many years later, um, my sister-in-law, who is also a physical therapy, they both sat down for a conversation at a family event. And my sister-in-law asked my aunt, who was you know, uh, a senior um, physical therapist and a professor in a university, she asked her, what would be your best advice for me as a you know, student of physical therapy for my work ahead. And what I, I sat there and I heard the conversation it, and it fascinated me, the answer that she gave her. She told her, do not fall into the trap of working hard. 
the easiest of work, the gentlest you will do, the bigger effect that you will see on your patients. And I just sat there with this biggest smile. I was so happy to hear this. And this is a woman with a lot of experience who worked with so many different, you know, injuries and, and, and illnesses and, and, and modalities of work. And, you know, at the, you know, the peak of her career, what she can tell a newer professional is be gentle. And many, and often in my work, I see people not moving at all. <laughs> and some of them feel great with it because they are so connected to their bodies and they know that this is the kind of work that they need, but others feeling like, should I be doing more? And sometimes even forcing themselves to do more than this nothingness, which is never nothing really, when we both know that. Mm -hmm. And me kind of telling them, it's okay, really, do less. Do not worry. You're not doing, it's not that your body is doing less. And it, it is just that you're lowering the activity to the most comfortable level for your body. And only from that most comfortable level can the body do its uh, self-healing work. Otherwise, it's being it's busy sustaining something that is difficult. So it's it's in the effort instead of, of in the healing uh, yeah. level. Yeah. So I love that you chose that specific story. It's just like perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I think we have an epidemic of 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 busyness and hurry and get it done and rush and. The body put a lot of energy into it. Yes, yes. Prove and it to everyone that you're doing, that you're serious about your work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And it's it's pretty incongruent with with healing the body. Like it just can't. They don't go together. <laughs> you know, busy and forcing and 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 hard. It just they just don't go together. Right. And so we made like a whole circle going back to ease. Ease. And Mess, which is yeah. so important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Was another something that I wanted to ask you about. All right. So tell me now that I can really pick your brain about your work. Can you tell me about how the unwinding is that correct? That is the term that you were That's using. That's the word that the fascia people use. Yeah. Right. How did it come about? I mean, how did it become part of the work? Is it because the body needed to express movement that was locked for a long while? How, I mean, tell me more about this. I'm super curious about it. Yeah, there's a lot of um, ideas about what's happening. Um, and I know in, in the fascial world, there are some methodologies that say this unwinding process is not, not real. It's not, legit, whatever. I'm telling you, it's real. It's real. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> it's real. It's um, interesting yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So the body is trying, a lot of times the body is trying to find the position of injury. Um, and so it's going to move and almost mirror how that happened. So say you fell off a horse, your body holds the memory of of the, like the jarring, the flip, the impact, and then everything that happened within that. And so that pattern lays in the fascia, just like the, you know, the needle going into the skin and making a twist, um, that injury is also going to hold a pattern. And so that pattern twists and contorts the fascia and in like the sweater, you know, the sweater twisting. Um, and what the body is going to do is move if you allow it if you, you know, you feel it and you allow it, it's going to move into those positions to find the area it needs to go to release the restriction. So basically it's going to move into the wall of tension. Um, so if you can imagine, it's going to tighten into the tightest point, which is where we find the position of injury. 
And in my work, when people are spontaneously moving, you know, they may arch and they may twist and their arms go and the legs go, and then all of a sudden they stop. Um, and then that is the wall of tension. And it is where the body feels the most pressure in the fascia. Um, I also find that's the place where the emotions start to come up because the body remembers what happened. Um, and then when the body starts, to, when the fascia starts to soften, the fibers are basically changing their molecular composition. They're breaking down, they're, they're changing. Um, so because the fascia is interconnected, all one, all one unit, when you activate one area of the fascia, the, it's gonna ripple into the rest of the body. Um, so that, that's how it works. That's amazing. Uh, two things that you said uh, fascinate me. The wall of restriction, you called it? Or the wall, what did wall you of, call it again? The wall of tension. The wall of tension. I love yeah. it. I love this term. Yeah. This is the one thing, because you said this is most probably where the body um, kind of like felt the shock of the injury or whatever it is that happened to it, right? The trauma. Right. The other thing that this that you said is that the movement will stop there. That's super interesting for me. Does it always stop or is there a, no? So no. some people can move along with that. They can. So I find um, with a lot of people, we avoid that wall of tension. We avoid it because it's painful. It's, it's physically painful, it's emotionally painful. So we compensate around it. So if the body needs to do this to get to that wall of tension, we may constantly do this. Like, like we may fold forward constantly. What do you, what, when you say we, do you mean uh, us people when we're injured or you as practitioners? What do you mean by we? We, we as in people in general. Um, people in general, okay. Like tendons, the tendency of the human, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of humans, yes. Yeah. So okay. when you have, a, like if you have a surgery and you're healing, you're, you know, we move a certain way because, because the scar hurts and, and it's painful and we're swollen. Well, over time, that becomes a habitual pattern of movement. And then because we don't fully move into the scar, that area solidifies and then we start compensating around it. So when we are unwinding or moving in free form, we may constantly be moving around that scar and never going into it. And that's my job is to help you slowly and safely move into those areas that are, are scarred and restricted to bring function back in there. Um, yeah. Alrighty, so two things. First of all, a question about the, the emotional release there. And also, if you may, and only if you want to, what is the, like, I love theories. <laughs> I make them all the time in my brain, <laughs> I admit. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I love to organize things so that they make sense for me to me. Yeah. Once I make this real organization in my head, then I just, I don't know, I feel more at ease, but it's not necessarily always the right theory, you know, like then I have to revisit it and, you know, change my beliefs or my thoughts. So I have my own kind of like way in which I look at the healing process like what happens in a free form session when the body does want to kind of like go to that place where pain is stored or a memory or some, some sort of discomfort or trauma or injury or something. I, I don't know what it is, but the body is interested in going there. I love it when it happens because I know that something very interesting will happen, but more than that, I know that healing will almost for sure happen there, there and then. Yeah. And it's just a process and we have to kind of hold it there and sometimes like 
tell our, our clients, our students, whatever we call them, like, don't worry, it will be all right. I'm with you here. Like, I'm holding this with you. You'll be fine to really help them kind of like get the courage and dive into there. And then really good things happen. Yeah. I think our fear is usually that it will stay there. It will stay stuck. It will stay in the pain. Absolutely. But it's rarely the case. Yes. And at times that it does happen, I say, okay, I think that the body needed more time with that. Yes. So we're going to give the body the space and the opportunity to go back to that place again next time when we meet. Yes. And then again, yes. it will most probably happen. So all, the, all of this big um, introduction just to say, do, do you also see this, I don't know, kind of order of healing that happens with your... Absolutely. Omelet? Okay, can you tell me a little bit about it? <laughs> yeah, so I, I realize I, I probably made it sound like, oh, we just move right into the trauma and we work with it and it doesn't nope, happen. Like it didn't ever. Sign like, sound like okay. that. So no worries. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with, with my method as well as with the Paula, which is what I love, I, we, listen, we listen to the body. Um, so I don't come in with, okay, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. No, I... I um, intuitively watch the body and then I feel the body and the body knows exactly how deep it wants to go, how fast it wants to go there, or if it wants to go there at all. And um, a lot of times with trauma, um, it will take a bit to get into there. So it's almost like we're, we're sneaking into it a little bit um, from the outer skirts of the body. Um, it, it will never be like we're right on a scar or we're right on an injury site. Um, so I, maybe I went left with answering your question. But no, it was so important. To the yeah. You just, yes. yeah. And I've had people say, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if I want to relive that trauma. I don't, will it hurt me if I, if I go there, will it hurt me? Will I stay stuck there? I've never seen that happen although it can feel like you're reliving it, but it's actually the body trying to bring it up to come out. Right. Yeah. So I'm curious to ask this, or I, I'm curious that I'm going to ask something. Do you feel that with your work, you kind of prompt the body to do that, or you're always following the body's cue, whether it wants to release the trauma or not? I mean, how... How, how polite and gentle are you with your clients' bodies approaching trauma? Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's a tough one because um, there, there have been times in, in my practice where I thought maybe, maybe I pushed it too far. And there's times I thought maybe I didn't push it enough. But in the end, it always turned out to be what it needed to be. For some people, I think they need permission to you can see, you can see things coming up in the throat where like there's little sounds that start coming out and maybe we've been taught the, those, those are weird noises or those are weird body movements. And it's just a matter of giving them permission to fully express whatever's coming up. That would be my encouragement. Um, sometimes I mirror what's happening in the body you know like if they're starting to make noises I'll mirror that and it's like oh it's okay it's safe and acceptable to do that because mm -hmm. you know we're, we're always we're always guarding and trying to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and, and yeah so to make everything uh legit in the space of healing um I'd like to start to wrap up our conversation. So I would like to ask you because I saw, <laughs> well, now we're deep into the work. So I already know that you really, you like, you enjoy the work with the Paula method. And I'm um, curious to hear from you, what is it that you like about this method? I mean, what is it that echoes there and resonates with what you know about the body and about healing that kind of attracts you into this kind of work. 
Yes, right? absolutely. Because if, it, it, because if it was like, okay, more of the same, you would just stick with your own method, right? But you absolutely. found there was something that was like, oh, and there is also this. So what yes. was this also this thing for you? <laughs> so I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so glad. Um, yeah, so I, I'm very fussy on um, my continuing education. <laughs> It's, it's really hard. Um, but so when I um, took that first session with you, it was like you had given me the master key into the body that I had lost or just didn't know existed. Um, and it was a, the sphincter system that I had no knowledge of. So I, I knew the muscular system and the fascial system as is, but then to have the the sphincter system and the way it's specifically interconnected and the power of it in combination with how I, I knew how to feel my body. It felt like it was this big aha moment of, Oh my goodness, you have just like unlocked a piece of me that it was, I knew it was there and I couldn't quite get to it. And now I'm there. And that was the one piece. The other piece is the gentleness of the work and the philosophy and um, how the mind body continuum is so intertwined and worked with together. It was just all that. Um, those are the, like my top, I think my top two or three loves about the Paula method. Thank you. I yeah. love you. One of the things that I'm always um, fascinated about and really surprised perhaps are the chain reactions that you notice. Because in a way, you constantly open up my eyes to chain reactions that I don't often hear about from other students and or not necessarily always looking for after lessons, during sessions or after them. And with you, I mean, there are things that you tell, you're telling me that I'm like, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, right. We know that and yes, beautiful that you notice it. I have to say that your um, responses are often very profound that I'm like, it's not only that you're feeling things, you're also really aware. And I think there's also, speaking of mirroring, Michael, who knows what to look for and then telling you, look, Kristen, this and this and this, this morning, <laughs> you know, the day after a session. Um, but really, I'm always very curious about the things that you feel as chain reactions and responses in your body uh, that are in many cases deeper than what I'm used to hearing. Um, so I don't know if I have anything else to say about this, but maybe you wanna uh, yeah. add something to that. Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations with um, my associates who are also work in, in the realm of the, the fascial matrix and I think I think once you open up that body system when you tapped into it and accessed it and I've done it you know on my body for 20 years so I, I work very I work very deep and I don't know how to not work that way anymore um, so what it does and I think this is the case for all clients it um, it makes you very in tune and aware of your body and you feel, everything um, as opposed to those that haven't. And those, I, I kind of compare it to like those that have very thick armor <laughs> and like they have, and they just don't feel like you don't feel. And when you've taken away that armor and work so deeply, you feel everything. Um, and so that, that can be, you know, a, a curse and a blessing at the same time, but, but that's, I, I attribute it to that. So, um, you know, when I'm doing Paula, um, I am feeling in my body so many, so many more things than even in my own work. And, and again, it's because I'm in this, you're holding this space for me, um, where 
I can, I can feel that. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. I'm just like you, by the way, like all those years, I always have my weekly session with my Paula teacher because I, I can feel things, you know, um, when I have her witnessing and validating what I'm doing, I, it is just so much deeper. And I do the work by myself all the time anyways. Yes. But it's just, it's a very special space where I'm not alone. And I have her with me kind of noticing, commenting, sometimes asking me questions like, does it often go this way when you work with yourself? And I'm like, no, this has never had never happened before. I'm like, ah. after all these years, you wouldn't expect it to be so surprising again and again and again. But it's always new. Like it's just yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I can I can teach I can teach anybody to to unwind, you know, and and we can and we do it. And even even Michael, like, you know, I said, did you unwind today? And he's like, yeah, but you, know, <laughs> you need that that extra to to make the work even more potent than it more powerful than it already is. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, I, we have to end. And I'd love you for just, you know, before we say goodbye, to please tell us, first of all, where people can find you and Michael. And also give us perhaps a short list of things that are most common for the two of you to work with so that people can kind of like, you know, recognize themselves or their children or loved ones and you know, connect with you uh, because you, you just help so many people. And I would like for more people to know about your work and to be able to uh, reach out and ask for your help. Uh, awesome. thank yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so our website is www.mifmcm. So it's M as in Mary, I, F, M, C, M. Um, I'll add that to the comments. Perfect. Yeah. And I'm available to talk about anything fascia anytime, anywhere. I'm currently not accepting clients in, in this moment, but my husband, Michael is. Um, and so all that information is on the website, how to book um, more information about the work and the packages. Um, the list of conditions. Um, let me see. So infants, we work on feeding, um, digestive, sleep, um, just general discomfort, trauma. Um, children, we work with developmental delays, um, you know, pain, like pain, digestive issues, um, airway issues, like bed, we do bed wetting, sleep issues. Um, you know, those are those are the easy basics. We do work with oral ties as well, um, either with or Repeat without. that because this is a big one. It is, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, many people do not know that you can treat that other than with surgery. So absolutely, I know it's a, about this. Yeah, I, I just posted about it in Israel. <laughs> I just gave your telephone number. <laughs> yeah, it's a hot topic, and it's not. Um, it's a complex fixed, but it gets to the root of the problem. We see oral ties as a symptom of the big body picture. Um, so the oral aspects of the mouth um, connect fascia wise through the entire body line. So yes, we can work either with it, with surgery or without surgery. We do both. And we, that's, you know, we don't tell people what to do. Um, so yeah, Lip ties. I just tongue wanted ties. to explain. Yeah, we're talking about tongue tie, lip ties, right? Cheek Upper lip, lower lip. Yeah. yeah, cheek ties. Um, so yeah, ties we work with. Um, and then, you know, trauma, um, headaches, back pain. Um, we have a lot listed on the website. We work, you know, with PTSD, anxieties, um, depression, mental, mental health issues. And many children with special needs as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Complex special needs also. Complex, yeah. If I may, if I may yeah. add. 
we're, we're usually the we've tried everything and people say we should see you so that's <laughs> we're we're those people absolutely i know that how it feels to be the last resort okay uh, so <laughs> all the others <laughs> we don't know what you do. i should just see you so we don't really know what you do but we heard that what you do is amazing so <laughs> it is amazing i have to say uh what you're doing and uh yeah we know that also from the um client's point of view so yeah yeah no, yeah, I want to say that I absolutely think it is an amazing work. All righty, Kristen, we can continue talking and I probably invite you again so we, that we can continue talking about other things uh, that interest both of us. But thank you so, so much for your time thank and you. a lovely conversation. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much, Mikhail. It's a pleasure. I love what you do as well. It's just amazing work. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you everyone for being here and I'll see you next time.